Hey, Tuco. Um, and hello, the internet. That was Tuco the cat in the background. Um, looks like the stream's getting started. We are live on the YouTube sphere. Are we live on the Twitch internet? I assume so. So we are streaming on the Scanlime in Progress channel on YouTube or on twitch.tv slash scanlime, as well as live.diode.zone slash scanlime. Getting the stream direct-ish from the source. Yeah, we're live. Tuco wants some attention. <laughs> oh man. There's been so much computering the last couple weeks to get my infrastructure here set back up after my storage kind of exploded. So I've got that mostly together, although you might notice the new noise in the background, which is not really desirable. I'm still working on a solution to that. Anyway, here we are. Um, so I, I didn't have this as planned out as I like to have streams. Um, this is me kind of trying to wrap up the, the Drobo um, NAS, uh, Network Attached Storage, uh, unbricking project. Um, we left this like a week and a half ago or so, how long ago? <laughs> um, and I was waiting on a bunch of the files to copy off of it. It was kind of slow. Um, can we turn this on? Yeah, so it took me a while to copy the files off. Um, it didn't seem like an especially high stakes data recovery operation uh, because I have offsite backups of, of all those files, or so I thought. Although I've been going through this really annoying process of reconciling all these giant data sets I have over the past week or so. And I did find a bunch of files which were missing from the offsite backups. So um, it's not quite clear why that happened, but my first inclination is to blame the uh, kind of suboptimal backup setup that I had before where I couldn't actually run the backup software directly on the Drobo because it didn't have enough memory. So I think it might have been failing to get full directory listings at certain points in time um, over NFS. So yeah, um, it turns out that I mostly had that data elsewhere, but it is actually really good that we got it off the Drobo since I might have lost like a little bit of footage. I think it was around a half a terabyte of footage from like a year ago. So not not extremely sure how relevant that would have been to the editing projects they go with, but it's certainly nice to actually have all of that. So yeah, it's been this big process of actually physically moving the data across a network cable. Um, the bandwidth limitation was really not actually the, the gigabit network though, but the, um, actually I think the bandwidth limitation was mostly the CPU speed on the Linux side of this. Um, as we talked about in the previous streams on this, this Drobo network attached storage appliance is a consumer NAS, uh, so network attached storage. And it's designed to be just sort of like a plug and play solution where you put in disks, it shows up on the network and you configure it a little bit. Um, under the hood, if you look a little bit le deeper, it seems to be a Linux system that you can like SSH into and install packages on to some extent, although it's pretty limited, mostly by the amount of RAM it has. That Linux system has a gigabyte and a half of RAM which is pretty small for a file server that I might want to have like a 30 terabyte data set on. You just start running out of room to cache directory entries and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so it's it's kind of, um, it's always been kind of a bottleneck on the metadata side, like, you know, listing and deleting files and like everything that requires keeping caches of the state of the whole disk array has been a huge bottleneck with the system. Um, and the Linux side has a ter like a gigabyte and a half of memory normally. Um, it actually runs on this quad core microcontroller and they use three cores and three quarters of the RAM to run Linux and the other core and the other quarter of the RAM to run VXWorks where they run their own kind of proprietary RAID layer. And so that, as far as I can tell, is basically the same, the same firmware that they run on the non-network attached Drobo products. So if you were to buy one of these Drobo devices um, this is in pieces right now, but <clears throat> this is one of their network attached products. I think if you buy the ones that are not network attached, they use basically the same firmware, but um, you know, I don't, I don't have one of those. So I can't really confirm that. Um, I guess I could download the firmware images and pick them apart. I just haven't done that. So anyway, yeah, kind of a slow process because this thing just is not very fast. Um, 
I think in the best of cases, over Samba at least, you get a little bit faster over, NF over NFS. I think over NFS, reading large files, I was able to get like 800 megabits over it, which is not that bad for a gigabit storage appliance. But really the bottleneck is in metadata and small files. Um, and SMB, like, so if you need SMB, if, like, NFS is kind of a bad protocol in a lot of ways, so it was a bit of a compromise to use NFS when I wanted the extra speed. Um, for normal use, I prefer SMB on, like, two or three, <laughs> certainly not SMB one, but, um, and, like, Samba has some interesting modern features, like, can support extended attributes and resource forks on the same file system. You can do weird stuff. And so, yeah, so Samba is interesting. I don't mind it, except it seems to max out the CPU on here. So over SMB, it seems to top out at about 60 megabytes a second, you know, about 600 megabits a second. So yeah, that's not great. That was about the best rate that I had to copy the entire thing out at. Um, and once I started getting into directories with more small files, um, and I don't even mean like kilobytes, I mean just like a couple of megabytes rather than like tens of gigabytes, <clears throat> then it was going down to like 20 megabytes a second or so. So yeah, it took like a week to copy all the data off. And it's mostly footage, um, like I have this big stockpile of footage, as you might imagine, for stuff that I've recorded but haven't actually edited yet. And um, that's actually been super annoying, because um, it's actually really hard to sort all of that footage having it on such a, such a slow storage device. So I had all of that stuff on here, um, you know, and maxing out at like a 60 megabyte per second. So if I'm if I was lucky and everything was just really smooth and uninterrupted, nobody else was using the NAS, like no seeking back and forth, just streaming I/O, then it was kind of usable for video editing if I wanted to go that route. But it really doesn't have the random I/O performance or the metadata caching performance that I need for video editing at all, and. Yeah, so I, I'd kind of just assumed that I wouldn't ever be able to edit directly off this Drobo, so my my process had been to copy chunks of footage off of here onto a local RAID. Um, at first that was spinning disks, although I was having trouble with them um, just being slow overall. I think part of that was actually just due to the disks um, just not having a good configuration um, in hindsight. Like, that was, that was Windows storage spaces, and I think I had some stuff set up that was not great in terms of like the number of disks and um, maybe even like the size of the disks and the type of controller I was using. So anyway, there were a bunch of reasons why my old spinning disk array were, was slow besides the fact that it had a bunch of like really old disks in it. So I, I then had a SSD array for my, you know, I got some SSDs. I again put them into a Windows storage spaces array on my editing machine, but I would still have to copy these, you know, a couple of terabyte chunks of footage at a time over and that, you know, that, that got to be kind of annoying, especially when the storage device was so slow to begin with. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just rambling about storage at this point, but TLDR, the whole setup I had around this Drobo was not quite cutting it. Like, it was, it was something that I got when I was mostly just trying to keep my computing infrastructure really lightweight and just, like, I mean, my, my primary machine is still this, like, tiny laptop and, you know, my, my like, personal machine, not, like, the work stuff down here. Um, and, you know, I, I still have a lot of this, like, lightweight computing infrastructure from this time when I was, like, living in a much smaller place and just had a lot less room for stuff. Um, and I got this during that period, but it was never really sufficient for actually dealing with large amounts of video. It just seems like it didn't have enough RAM to deal with, you know, like, 30 terabytes of disks, and it didn't really have enough like caching or random I.O. performance to deal with anything short of like, you know, absolutely pristine conditions for streaming video. Um, so yeah, that's been frustrating. Um, so I developed this workflow around this where all my recording goes to local disks. I'm not planning on changing that. I don't really like relying too much on network servers. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm starting to talk about how I'm going to edit, be editing footage directly off of a video server. So that's kind of breaking my rule a little bit. But like, if I have to pause my editing to go like plug a cable back in because something broke, then that's not as big of a deal as if I'm like in the middle of recording and I lose the entire stream because a disk failed or a network cable failed or something. Um, so I like to try to record locally and then just like rsync that elsewhere when I'm done. And I don't think I'll change that. But as far as editing, 
um, now I'm on this system where I just have a nice big storage pool where I can just dump everything there after recording and then edit directly off of that. Um, and I took the SSD drives that I had been using and I split them up so I have a couple of them in my editing machine as like Adobe Premiere cache disks because it'll just happily write terabytes of local data for um, like, I think a lot of it is like indexes that help it find um, data in video files, but a lot of it is also like um, like resampled audio and like thumbnails and stuff like that. And so having an SSD or several SSDs locally for that is still super helpful. But then I took the rest of the SSDs and I put them in the main, the new storage machine. So yeah, I, I spent a bunch of time dealing with technology. Um, this is not my first rodeo with ZFS, but I, I got to learn some more about ZFS to, to set this part up. Um, so yeah, I've got uh, I've got this machine, which now the major problem is that it's just a little bit loud, and I need to figure out what to do with that. Either I try to retrofit the cooling. Everybody, everybody, everybody suggests putting in Noctua fans. I'm not actually convinced that's a good idea, but I'm going to try it. Um, and I, I will actually probably have to reserve some time here on the stream to make some 3D printed adapters to fit the fans that I have into the server. Um, because the server uses extra wide fans and kind of specialized adapters uh, to mount those. And two goes over here. Quiet night tonight. How's everyone else's Monday? I've been feeling kind of kind of depressed like the last week or so, but it's hard to tell how much of that is just Monday and how much of it is like the world. How much of it is like brain weasels. Mostly I've just been feeling really lonely. I feel like I don't know where to find like peers or like the right kind of community or something. I think a lot of that is just on me. Like a lot of it is I just have a really hard time trusting or interacting with anyone after a bunch of shit that I went through years ago. And like, I, I, I know what it's like to be more outgoing because I've been that person before I got hurt by a bunch of things going wrong. So like, I, I, I know that that exists. I just haven't been feeling it lately. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, also, people, people tend to really, really like to suggest that I just take a vacation or something, but there's a lot of reasons why that doesn't work. Um, and I, I guess the TLDR of that is that I, I kind of tried that and it didn't really go anywhere. Like, like I took some time off and I wasn't really sure what else to do and I wasn't sure like how, well, it sort of led in a bunch of directions and I didn't really end up liking a bunch of them. And I guess I could go into that more, but that's the, that's the short answer. Yeah, the world's been frustrating and, and stressy lately. Um, and yeah, the storage array has been not completely drama free because I keep having to move these big data sets around that I don't quite have room for and trying not to lose any data. And I've got a bunch of just like old hard disks that have been sitting around in boxes that I wanted to get the data off of and figure out what's worth keeping and keep that backed up and on reliable storage if it is worth keeping and delete it if it's not. Um, and then I get to use those disks as part of the raid. So that's what I, that's the kind of route that I went down. The Drobo was nice when I was trying to optimize for, I have a tiny desk and a tiny apartment and I want all my data to be in a small space and really not loud. Um, and the Drobo was pretty good about that. Like the big, the big downsides here, well, the number one downside is that it bricked itself and we can talk about more about what happened there. But that would, be, that would be, I would argue, the number one downside. Um, the number two downside is that after it bricks itself, the only way to get your data off of it is to either unbrick it or buy another one. So that would be the number two downside. And then the number three downside is that it's actually pretty slow because it's, at least this version, is underpowered in the CPU and RAM department. Um, I suspect that's part of what they would have fixed in the new version, because the version here is obsolete. Um, and I'll go into this more later, but I know that they know about the problem that caused this brick issue and that they have addressed it in future versions. So, you know, that's, that's something that maybe doesn't affect people who are looking to evaluate these things for future use. But uh, yeah, I guess I can't tell you if it's fast now. The one that I have certainly wasn't. Um, but it was good for a lot of what I used it for. But um, yeah, I, my, my route nowadays 
uh, has been to more just like try to get on parts that are really easy to replace when something goes wrong. Because as nice as it is, you know, this idea that I can just have a shiny, you know, monolithic box that I never have to maintain because someone else is like providing it as this nice shiny surface, like it's never true. It's, it's like nice on the surface, but that never actually turns out to be the case. Like that's, that's like a little bit of what lulled me into my current 3D printer actually, because I was, I was like tired of having a really bad 3D printer and I was willing to spend a little bit more money to get a 3D printer that was like really nicely designed and had like really nice, you know, longevity behind it potentially. And then I ended up with a 3D printer made by a company that goes under and then so now I'm on my own again. So like you basically can never actually trust the manufacturer as far as I'm concerned. You know, there are some devices where it's like hard to not trust the manufacturer, like modern cell phones. There's just not really a lot of repairability under there to be had. Um, you know, we can talk about more about why that is and like what ways around that. But yeah, that's pretty frustrating. But at least in the area of like server hardware, there's, you know, you don't have to go down that route. The main compromise is though, you know, I've been trying to just like go for cheap hardware on eBay and fix it up. and. That's great, it just ends up being loud and power hungry. Um, so the power hungry part is something I've been trying to mostly just deal with by just consolidating stuff onto fewer devices and then just having like maybe one or two power hungry devices instead of like a bunch, um, which is not ideal, but is fine. Um, it's certainly more power hungry than the Drobo was, but at least it's a lot faster and does a lot more of what I need. Um, yeah, and then the noise is kind of annoying. It's um, it's not as bad as the 2U server I had, but yeah, the 4U server actually uses the same 80 millimeter high velocity fans. So when the fans actually spin up, it's really, really loud. Right now the fans are PWM'd down pretty low. Um, it's just that I think the fans still actually just are pretty fast, even when they're PWM'd down. So. Um, you know, there's a bunch of routes to try to solve this. I think at the current level of loudness, I could probably put it in the closet where the 3D printer is and it wouldn't really be bothersome. Um, and then the main problem is just that I don't have a lot of space in there for a full-size rack mount machine. Um, I either have to kind of completely change how things are laid out in there, or I think I think my, my interim solution is going to be I attach some casters to a piece of plywood, put the server on that, and then just put that on the floor in the closet. And I think there's room to just have it hang out on the floor for a bit. Um, Cause I don't necessarily want to build a bunch of rack infrastructure before I even know if there's enough cooling in there. Or by cooling, I mean draftiness because this building is cooled by the drafty outdoors blowing in. <laughs> so yeah, um, a little bit of electric heat in the closet would not actually be a bad thing if it's within reason, because both the isopods and the 3D printer could actually use it to be a little bit not cold in there. Um, but yeah, that's one option. Another option is to try to replace the fans. Um, I think it's likely I'm gonna try that just cause like I already bought the fans. I think I might as well just do it. It just requires some work in designing new fan mounts. Um, I've got a bunch of logging set up so that I can get a baseline idea of what all the temperatures are right now, and then we can try modifying it and see what the temperatures do and if they're still all right. I'm most worried about the disk temperatures and the disks are the easiest to keep cool, so maybe this will be all right. The SSDs are maybe harder to keep cool, but I mean, I'm all right with just putting a fan right on top of the SSDs. Gosh, so dehydrated today. Oh yes, and um, Jarrett's beating me to it, asking if, if there's any, anything to come from uh, the Drobo engineers. So yeah, in parallel with investigating this thing on, on my own and on the streams here, um, I, I was complaining about it on Twitter a little bit, which caused the Drobo tech support search bots to inform the Drobo tech support humans that I should file a support request. So that whole process was kind of annoying at first. Um, you know, cause like, like most of these support organizations, they kind of give customers the runaround a bit at first. And it was so, it was kind of frustrating trying to convey like the specific problem I was having while trying to avoid getting like extremely general advice. Um, 
and I don't know, they, so during that process, I got a few different responses. Um, you know, the very first thing that I got was like, oh, it looks like your Drobo is out of warranty. Uh, here's a coupon for $250 off the new $500 model so that you can buy a new one and rescue your data, which was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> and that would kind of inspired me to, to, you know, try to fix it myself, right? Because I didn't want to have to take that offer. Um, but yeah, we, I, I went back and forth with tech support some more. And um, during the course of these streams, you know, I got to the point where I could see the exact reason it wasn't booting. You know, like I, I could tell that there were probably multiple problems. You know, I couldn't necessarily point my finger at an exact root cause, but I could point my finger at the specific reason that my unit on my table right now is not booting as some zeros being written into the bootloader on the power microcontroller on here. So, there, and there's like a bunch that seems bad about that, right? It's like, it's like that kind of points a finger at the update process. Um, you know, not like 100%, because like knowing what I know now, that same flash memory is kind of loosely partitioned into regions that are used as sort of application firmware, bootloader firmware, and settings. And so I think what was happening is they were trying to write into the settings area, but then something went wrong. Um, but still, it kind of points a big finger at like bad firmware design because normally hardware has a bunch of safeguards to prevent that from happening no matter what. Like even if your power goes out, like even if your microcontroller oscillator fails, like it should at least give you, like, like a well-designed product should at least um, have resilience against like a failure happening during a flash memory write. Um, and the way you achieve that is either by like a combination of having multiple copies of things and like write protecting critical regions. Um, and it's, I don't know for sure, but I haven't seen any evidence that any of the flash memory was write protected. Um, I certainly didn't have to unprotect it to write over it with uh, my, the MSP430 debugger. Um, and it looks like maybe what happened is, you know, one of those settings writes just ended up clobbering the bootloader. But um, so anyway, I had, I had this evidence that something went wrong with the bootloader and I had patched it so that it would boot. And then we gradually got the system into a state where it would at least run with four of the five disks and I could copy my data off. Um, and as I mentioned, it was, it's actually kind of good that I actually got it into that state because my, um, I had an offsite backup. My offsite backup wasn't 100% complete, and so it's nice to actually get all the data off of the off of the Drobo. There was a problem I hadn't noticed with probably some of the NFS shenanigans earlier. Um, and so anyway, I I was it was about bleh, it was at about the point where I had this you know set of log files showing the hole in the flash memory that something blew. Um, that I I guess. Um, I don't know what, what the actual order of operations was here, but I think actually some of the Drobo folks had been following the streams already. Um, hi, Drobo folks, by the way, <laughs> um, if, if anyone's watching. Um, yeah, so I, I think they might have been aware of the streams already, but maybe some combination of, you know, the streams and, um, you know, going through the process with tech support managed to get the right person's attention. And eventually I got an email from the uh, VP of engineering at Drobo. <laughs> and, um, and so that was actually super useful. The, the VP um, gave me a slightly more detailed explanation of the problem, um, said that it was a known bug, um, but they were interested in my files just so that they could confirm that it was the same problem. So yeah, I sent them a package of files um, basically the whole contents of the USB disk and the flash memory dumps that I made and the modified and unmodified versions of the MSP430. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the VP of engineering uh, in, in his response email said that the, the problem um, that they were aware of was related to this, uh, this it sounded, I don't know, I th he was being a bit vague about what exactly it was trying to do, but it was, it sounded like a configuration update um, and he said that it was just part of the normal boot process and that this configuration update included a flash memory write, you know, like a critical section where it would switch to battery power briefly in order to make sure that the critical section was uh, maintained and that it didn't lose power during that write. And it didn't actually notice that my battery was completely flat. So it switches to battery power 
the battery immediately dies while it's writing the critical section. And that, so that was his explanation for what went wrong. They just didn't anticipate having a battery failure that I guess it didn't otherwise notice. I, you know, I still don't know why it didn't otherwise notice this battery failure. That's kind of a weird question, um, or an open question, kind of a weird, a weird aspect of this. Um, but, you know, either maybe the battery was reading a good voltage, like, until it was put under load, I don't know. I measured the battery out of circuit and got zero volts, but maybe the charging circuit causes it to look like it's higher or something temporarily. Um, but anyway, in the response, uh, he said that the, uh, this process expected to be able to run off a of battery power for, like, 30 milliseconds and managed not to, and that's what corrupted my flash memory. So it's an interesting explanation. Um, I think he offered a more detailed explanation um, over the telephone, but we haven't actually talked over the, over the phone yet. Um, I'm, I'm really bad at telephones. I might do that, but I'll have to work up the, uh, work up the social spoons for it. Um, so yeah, that's interesting and kind of gives maybe some more clues if we wanted to go deeper into looking at what's going on with the MSV430 here. But um, yeah, I guess a lot of what I wanted to do right at this juncture is just try to figure out what to do with the stream, what to do with this, um, with this project, really, because I think there was some interesting video footage that I would like to turn into an episode of some sort, but um, it's not clear to me how this episode should end. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. Um, how do we wrap this up? So I copied all my data off. I took the five drives that were in here and stuck them in my new NAS. So the new NAS is currently chomping on those just fine. Um, I hope the new NAS has been not without its problems, but has been mostly, mostly fine. <laughs> and thankfully the backups are almost up to date. So, um, yeah, the, the old five disks from here are in the new NAS, but I have a stack of kind of, um, crash test dummy disks over here that we can use for testing if we want. Just a bunch of kind of old disks that I don't mind doing like random writes and power ons and power offs on here. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Mr. Radar suggests a two-part video, one where I fix the Drobo enough to get my data, and then a second one where I build up a new custom NAS. Um, yeah, that'd be doable. I didn't really record video while I was building this NAS, but I could certainly talk about it. And um, part, part of the reason I didn't record video is because it's a lot of like hurry up and wait. It's like, oh, I've got to wait for it to copy like 20 terabytes of data. And now like, oh my gosh, it's about to run into just disk space. I better delete a bunch of snapshots before it runs out of disk space. And so it's a bunch of that, which is kind of frustrating. Um, but then I also just didn't want to like, like working on personal infrastructure on stream is just a lot more stressful because I have to more closely guard like personal information leaks. So um, that's just like harder to do logistically. Um, but I could certainly do a video that like summarizes what I've got right now. I, I was even going to show some of that on stream because like, while I do try to keep my like work and personal infrastructure separated somewhat, I can show you at least one view of what the file server looks like from here. <laughs> oh, that's that's brutal. Trevor asks if there are any chips any chips in the Drobo that are worth pulling for new projects. Um, geez, well, I don't know about chips. I mean, desoldering anything from there is probably a lot more trouble than it's worth because it's almost entirely BGA. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, the back plane and the main board are separable. So, like, if I needed just, like, a plain old SATA back plane without any controller chips, really, um, but I don't know. Like, I've, since I've been building stuff with standard components now, I'm, I'm aware of how inexpensive completely standard Supermicro backplanes are, like, off of eBay. Um, I had to replace the backplane in one of the server chassis that I got here. So it's not the one I'm using right now, it's the 2U, which I got a while ago for completely different reasons. But I was using it to prototype some stuff for what's now the 4U server. Um, and the 2U box needed a new backplane because whoever previously owned that server had kind of just like ripped off a connector from the backplane pretty, pretty badly. So, um, but I, I found one on eBay for like 30 bucks and seemed pretty cool for like professional server gear or whatever that can handle 12 disks. Um, I actually learned the difference between the 12 disk and the 24 disk backplane now. Um, yeah, the 12 disk backplane apparently has like separate channels for all the disks, whereas the 24 disk has like a, like a router, which is interesting. Never used, never used these big like SAS backplane systems before, so there's been some learning curve there. 
Um, but yeah, um, so I don't, I don't know about like pulling individual chips, um, but yeah, it's like an interesting embedded system. Like it might be interesting to try to make like an open WRT port for it or something. Like, you know, I wonder if there are any like existing embedded Linux distros that I could drop on there. Um, Cause yeah, like I, it's, I'm sure there's a lot of great engineering that goes into their, their RAID layer, you know, and it supports some interesting features. Like you can just like add and remove disks pretty much add w at will. Um, it's much more dynamic than a lot of storage systems. It seems to, um, so actually, actually one thing that was really getting on my nerves when I was copying the data off, um, it's, it's a little frustrating in that context, but I was noticing as I was trying to copy the data off this degraded array with four of the five disks there, it was actually trying to rebalance the data. I, I don't know if that's great when it's degraded, but it actually is kind of cool that it can do that. That seems more like, if you're familiar with ZFS, there's this like kind of unicorn off the horizon somewhere that's, that is ZFX, ZFS block pointer rewriting. And it seems like the Drobo block layer maybe does something kind of like that already. So it's got some interesting features. It just sucks that it's proprietary. And if you don't have one of their devices, you can't access the data. So that's, that's like kind of how I feel about, about that. Um, it might be interesting to make like an emulator that runs their block layer on a normal Linux machine so that you can access the data in other circumstances, like offline backups or whatever. Um, so you can make like images of the RAID and then access them for backup purposes. Like that might be interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know really what to do with it. Oh, they also, um, I should mention, uh, they offered that I could uh, actually bring my <laughs> hacked up Drobo 5N, um, which is this model, to their, um, I don't know if it's their headquarters, but it's like one of their engineering uh, offices, which is local to me-ish. Um, it, would, it would take me like two hours to get there. So it's not like extremely local, but it's local enough that I could make kind of a day trip of it if I wanted to visit one of their engineering offices and bring my box of wires and they would replace it with a shiny new Drobo 5N2, which is their current model. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't totally decided if, if that's uh, a good idea at this point, but um, it seems very generous of them and um, we could do that. So yeah, you know, there's some options here. We could try to turn this into an embedded Linux project. We could just try to put it back together and get it kind of working. And I don't know, I don't know what it ha what happens with it at that point. Um, yeah, I could I could get on a get on a train for a couple hours and try to swap it for a new one. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to do at this point. Like, I, I feel like the Drobo is. Um, not really useful to me personally anymore because I don't necessarily have any particular storage needs that I would trust it for at the moment. Um, like maybe if I wanted a separate physical device for like backups here or something, I don't know. It's like hard to come up with a reason why I want a proprietary raid box right now in my life, you know? So, um, you know, maybe there's a way I can fix this up enough that someone else can use it. Maybe I take them up on their offer to just exchange it. Maybe I sell it on eBay. I don't know. Maybe I give it away to one of you. Uh, maybe someone on Patreon wants it. I don't know. Let me know. Um, I think right now it might be useful just to like try to power it on with all five disks and see if we can reproduce that problem we were having with the disk power. Um, Cause I did have to make this one kind of weird compromise where I couldn't actually power it on with all five disks. And I don't know what the source of that problem was. It was, it could have been like an electrical problem. I didn't really check, you know, whether it was a power issue at that level. Um, you know, so like it could be a physically bad power switch on the back plane. It could also just be some kind of weird random software crash that we haven't been able to diagnose yet. Um, several streams ago, I got pretty deep into the weeds on trying to figure out exactly where that crash was coming from. And it was leading me just deep into like kernel um, exception handlers. Uh, you know, it was, it's, it was like an ARM exception happening in the VxWorks kernel somewhere. And the the features that would normally just dump that out to the serial port seem to be disabled. And so either I have to figure out how to use the debugger to do like some kind of manual dump of that, or I don't know, I was having a lot of trouble just even getting it to, uh, even like getting into a position where I could 
add breakpoints even. So I had to do like binary patching and then reproduce the problem and that kind of thing. <laughs> Fred suggests trying to cause the same problem with the new model. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the VP was, uh, was uh, claiming that they, they knew about this problem and fixed it. So, um, you know, not just in the new model, but even in the new firmwares with the old model. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what kind of bot folks are trying to talk to in the Twitch channel, but someone wants uptime. I've actually only been going for 30 minutes here. <laughs> oh, interesting. Jason from YouTube seems to have just put a, a 24 micro or 24 base super micro in their rack recently. It might be the same one. I, I forget which uh, model number this is, but it was a pretty common one. Uh, let me see if I can get this on the camera. Let's see. It's over here on this desk, kind of taking up space right now. It's definitely got the blinking lights. It's definitely lower. Uh, it's definitely not lower noise than the the Drobo. It's uh, and I think I think it's often been drawing about 400 watts. I don't know what it'll be at idle because it hasn't really had any idle time yet. It's been pretty much constantly busy with moving stuff around and doing backups and stuff like that since I set it up. It's got blinkies on the backside too, because it's got SSDs in the slots, um, and the SSDs are acting as cache. <laughs> Gotta hold my tongue at the right angle to navigate the robot, right? Oh cool, now the server will keep the robot warm. <laughs> This is, I'm par parked right in the warm end. Oh man, and the SSDs have been such an annoyance too, man. I, I had this bright idea to put a bunch of consumer SSDs in my editing machine and make them into a disk array. And it's really fast, it's, it's so fast. I mean, um, NVMe SSDs specifically, not SATA SSDs. And so it's, it's been great, it's been fast, it's been awesome. And, and just every so often I reboot and like half the disks are missing. And so, ah, it's been super annoying. Um, and so I had a couple different brands. I have, um, I have a couple of these uh, server SSDs that actually Fred from chat right now donated, thanks. One of them is working. <laughs> I still don't know what's wrong with the other one. I've been, I was trying to diagnose it again last week and um, it still seems like maybe bad RAM or not bad RAM, but like bad flash or bad firmware, but I can't quite tell. Um, but the other one is working great. Um, I was using it as a cache disk in my editing machine for a while, but um, it seems to get along better with the BIOS in the server machines. So I have it as ZFS cache now, and I have a couple of the Samsung consumer SSDs in my editing machine, which seems to get along better with its, mo its motherboard. Um, but yeah, this one now has three of these awful HP SSDs, which I had a ton of problems with in the other motherboard. But this motherboard seems to get along with them a little bit better. But one of the four that I have had some bad sectors, so I took it out of service. So yeah, storage is just such a mess. And, you know, I'm just like trying to get by with the inexpensive parts, but also just trying to not end up with parts that are broken. And so like trying to find the right line to walk there. Oh, that's interesting. Trevor suggests that for more like social engagement on these streams that we could start a project with uh, on something that's popular. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna have to look into that. Um, motion. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's like I'll I'll have to think about it. I'm having I'm having I have weird feels about about these projects sometimes. But yeah, I don't know, so we could start new projects. I, I feel like there's already so much that I'm just, like, that I've already started that I need to find a good conclusion for. Um, 
Some of that I need to prioritize based on what's taking up space in the server, and some of that I need to prioritize based on what's taking up space in the shop. Um, so yeah, I, I need to do a stream or two upcoming to, uh, to take apart some of these big objects. Um, so that, that black thing there is an arcade cabinet, which I think might be an interesting project for the future, but I need to at least like just take stock of what state it's in and like what's worth keeping and what's worth like redoing. Um, so that I might keep around, but it, we need to at least look at it. <laughs> then this big old crate thing in the middle. Ah, I hate this thing. This was an art project from years ago, um, which I could show you footage from. It's like kind of pretty, it's interesting, but I have, I have such bad feels about it. So like, I just want to do a stream where I just take it apart and like, just take it apart, just decommission it. Just take all the, take all the art, just like lay it out on video and then, and then recycle the parts in whatever way seems appropriate. So that's something I want to do soon because it's taking up space both in the shop and in my brain and I don't want to deal with that. I'd rather it take up space in my disc array. Yeah, I don't know. I have weird feels about like Leap Motion and I have weird feels about like video game modding as a community but maybe this is distinct enough from video game modding that it isn't terrible. I just pretty much don't ever want to work in the console scene ever again, because those people are not people I want in my life, really. Shop on fire, no, please not. That's not a good idea. That's, that's to be avoided. That's interesting. Jason, who's the person in chat who said they also put in one of these 24 bay super micro machines, said that they swapped out the motherboard for something else and without a RAID controller and they're using it as a JBOD instead of a SAS. I don't understand why that's important for noise. Like in my experience, like I'm, I'm gonna try swapping out the 80 millimeter fans, but a lot of the noise is coming from the power supplies. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. Like, do you also mod the power supplies? I'm still trying to figure out what to do, to do with that box. Um, I've got a great spot for it over here, except that it's too loud to be right next to where I'm recording. So I've got, I've got a rack right here. I've got power, I've got a big UPS, I've got space, I've got bandwidth. It's great, except that I don't want all the noise right here. So all the machines in that rack right now, I've built specifically to be really quiet so that I can record right next to them. And, and this machine is not quiet and I don't need it to be right next to where I'm recording. So I'm trying to think about where else I can put it. Um, it really just needs power and network, but it needs to be kind of close by, I guess. <laughs> so I wasn't actually sure how much network I needed. Um, it was really appealing to me to get 10 gigabit setup between it and my editing machine since I kept hitting the uh, limit on my 10 gigabit connection. Um, and so I did that and it's been actually kind of good, but um, I don't get that much more than one gigabit. A lot of it's limited either by CPU or by the storage devices. So um, I think best, best case I've been able to see it do like six gigabits between, you know, like stuff that's cached in RAM on one side and the other side with a single core transfer. Um, but if I'm going up to parallel transfers, I can max out the 10 gigabit link. But it turns out that Adobe Premiere does not do much in parallel. It is, it is not nearly as multitasking as I would expect it to be. So a lot of times it's just sitting there with a single core maxed out decoding video that it can read at like 60 megabytes a second, which is not that great. Like I, I, I feel like professional applications should really have a lot more multitasking now, but maybe they're working on that. Um, so yeah, it, it seems like maybe links greater than one gigabit are not especially important for the even the editing setup, but it certainly helps for moving large files around. Uh, like I can import content much faster, which is nice. Um, so yeah, that's been interesting. Um, got some got some Intel cards uh, for like one hundred and twenty dollars on eBay that would have normally been like over five hundred. So that was that was nice. And I think there are a lot of there are a lot of low cost ways to get into 10 gigabit now, um, 
you can do fiber or optical, or sorry, you can do uh, copper or optic, optic fiber, but the optic fiber um, is actually pretty inexpensive um, if you go for the short range stuff and not the long, long range single mode fiber. Yeah, it's, it's redundant power supplies, which is also pretty cool. The other 2U machine I had here has room for two power supplies, but I only actually have one power supply. So this one has two power supplies. Um, yeah, I have one of them connected to a kilowatt, which has been measuring at about 200 watts. So I think it's, I think they're sharing at about half load. I don't, I don't actually have the other one uh, measured right now. Looks like my backups might have finished. That's interesting. Jason in chat again chimes in that Supermicro actually makes a super quiet version of their power supplies. That's cool. Do they fit into the same hot swap cages or do they replace that entire power supply unit? Because that's cool. I've heard of people modding these 4U machines to take desktop power supplies, but that might also be a good option. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm basically open for all sorts of mods in, on, the, on the chassis. Um, Right now, it's pretty much stock. Like I, I was expecting that it might even be slightly broken, but it wasn't even slightly broken. I pretty much all I've had to do with it was, um, you know, configure it and put in some SSD cards and disks. Even came with all the caddies. Yeah, I mean, if I can get the noise levels down to you know basically typical 120 millimeter fan low noise PC kind of noise levels, which is what I have in most of my rack, then I think we'll be fine. Um, this room tends to be kind of cold and has a plenty of just like natural draftiness. Plus, I've got a bunch of 120 millimeter exhaust fans on the whole rack, so the rack itself doesn't tend to run too warm. Oh, Jason's giving me a model number to look up. Let's try that. Looks like it fits into the same power supply cages. SQ. Gosh. If I were to buy two of these, that would be almost what I paid for the entire server. I wonder if I can find these used, though. Yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't been buying any of this server stuff new, because it's just so, so much cheaper used. Which is nice. It's like you're not going to get the absolute newest stuff, which is maybe a deal killer for you know a data center. But for my little operation here, it's fine. It doesn't need to be peak efficiency, really. Anyway, yeah, I'll have to look into that. Um, Cause yeah, I got I got some of these 80 millimeter. Um, low noise fans, which I'll have to 3D print some adapters for because the thickness is different. But yeah, maybe that plus this quieter power supply and it'll just hang out in the rack here. That could be cool. Because that would, that would be a lot less annoying than having to find room for it in the closet where it would just kind of be really in the way no matter where I put it versus being in the rack. It would be, it would just be exactly where it's supposed to be and take up basically no additional space, which is great. I'd have to reorganize stuff, but Part of what I've been doing here is also just moving a bunch of just like terrible, small, unreliable storage into one place where I can properly back it up and have proper redundancy and monitoring. Um, and so I might be able to decommission one or two of these small machines that I've got on shelves in that rack and then I can just use all that shelf space for a for, a for you server. Oh, cool. Jason says, apparently I can get those power supplies used for like 70 bucks on eBay. Yeah, that might be the route then. Maybe I swap in a couple of those power supplies and then try to build brackets to get to use the low noise fans that I already bought. 
cool. Yeah, so this is the this is the monitoring. Um, really interesting temperature spread on all the hard disks in the new server. Um, it is quite a speed demon at our clone. So one of my biggest complaints with speed on the Drobo was that doing the offsite backups, it was just extremely limited by the low RAM on here. Um, so if I ran our clone, which is this like basically cloud version of rsync. If I ran that on here, it would just instantly run out of memory. Even if I tried to tweak the buffer sizes as much as possible, it just could not run usefully fast with the amount of memory on here. Um, and then running it on a different machine, I have this other kind of small machine, but it still has like eight gigs of RAM. And so I would run our clone on there, but mount the file system over NFS. And even just the performance of the NFS server would just make that terrible. So yeah, it's nice to actually finally pretty much max out the gigabit connection between me and Backblaze to make the offsite backups. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, the ZFS has not been completely without drama. I was just on the edge of my seat today because it's been having some weird IO timeouts, which I thought were related to disk spin down, but I'm not entirely sure about that. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's it's probably fine, but might lead to data loss, and it's hard to tell. So, yeah, thank goodness for backups. Um, yeah. But yeah, the end result of this is that I now have a really fast connection to all of my footage on the actual editing machine, which is this. And so it's finally going to make it a lot easier to actually deal with this and easily kind of edit stuff without having to spend as much time moving files around. So very happy about that. Just go right into Adobe Premiere here, which just updated. Yeah, so if you're just coming here, I, I did some streams about fixing this Drobo here. Um, and it's at the point now where I am basically done with that and trying to figure out what to do next with this. It's um, I've got all the data I need off of here. I don't have an immediate need for this object, but we could treat it as another project. We could take up Drobo on their offer to maybe swap this out for a new model. Um, I could give it away to someone, one of you who might want it. I don't know, there's, there's some options here. Yeah, no, that's fine. So yeah, as as usual, the um, the bottlenecks are not entirely clear in this in this software, and I suspect a lot of it is still single-threaded CPU overhead. tell me which network interface is which. Because if I open it up. Um, OK, so that's just like the general purpose network. That's, that's virtual. That's like probably for Docker. Um, that's the gigabit, or sorry, the 10 gigabit fiber. One thing I do a lot is just like scrubbing through video at high speed. All of this right now is coming from the SSD cache because this is green. So like this doesn't even need the server to be fast. Um, if I was going to regenerate this cache, then I think I usually see it downloading at approximately single core video decoding speeds, which is not nothing to write home about. Um, yeah, copying files, it certainly uh, certainly goes pretty fast. Let's try copying to an SSD. This is an array of two striped NVMe SSDs. Let's try copying to that. Yeah, so like, like that's a couple of gigabits, you know? So if I had, if I had opted to go with like five gigabit copper instead of 10 gigabit fiber, 
would have been probably exactly the same performance. And for most editing tasks, it seems like gigabits probably enough. But yeah, it wasn't too expensive and it's an interesting experiment with actually making my storage faster here, I guess. Um, yeah, so like, I don't know, a lot of the last couple weeks has just been just computer, 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 just moving data, setting up backups, figuring out what to do with all this mess. Um, I don't know. I've been talking about this enough, though. Let's, uh, let's maybe boot up this Drobo and see if we can reproduce the problem. I think writing to the network disk actually is a lot faster because then I'm not limited. So I think that speed actually, I was limited by the speed of the mechanical disks on the file server because um, it can only read those so fast. It doesn't have everything cached. But if I'm writing, then if it, as long as it's an asynchronous write, I can cache stuff in RAM for quite a while. So writes can be fast and then they end up streaming to multiple disks. And so writes in general can just be really, really fast on the system. Um, I don't want to leave this on the server long enough that it ends up in any backups, but let's temporarily stick this here. Oh, actually, if I put it here, it doesn't end up in backups. Oh, gosh. What even was that? Do I have any files that are big enough that I can actually copy them and it will take time? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I should just try something real and actually import an SD card full of footage for my camera when I have that and see how, how that clocks. I'm sure that'll just be limited by the speed of the SD card. Anyway, TLDR, the new file server is fast enough. So uh, that makes, makes a nice uh, replacement for the Drobo. Bone in chat says, well, there's the whole MSP430 micro rabbit hole. Uh, which one do you mean? Because, like, I'm curious what specifically you think we should do with the M MSP430. Um, like, we could just reverse engineer more of the firmware. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what specific questions I'd want to answer, though. Um, it seems like I understand the broad outlines of what the MSP430 is responsible for, and, like, we could talk about that. Um, but I... I don't know, like, are there other specific questions that you'd, you'd want to see answers for? Yeah, I think, I think for, for editing, um, if I could do, like, two bonded gigabit links, like, that might be pretty great. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to use the 10 gigabit cards because I have them, like, unless I've got a different machine that needs the speed more, but um, it's nice for that not to be the bottleneck on the editing machine. Oh yeah, I guess this was, this is another view of the new server here. Um, this share right here is basically what the Drobo was dealing with. Um, I used it for some backups, but it was mostly holding on to video footage. Well, let's see. I think I already had, or I still had these serial, um, these serial cables connected. We could try just powering it back on. I think MSP430 debug needs to be power cycled when I power cycle this whole thing. Oh, actually, I never turned off the MSP430, so it's actually just been sitting here in low power mode for, like, the last several days. So I think we can just push the button and watch it boot if nothing else is wrong. So just rehash the setup here. It's 
interesting. Sometimes this doesn't make a lot of noise, and sometimes it does. I'm not really sure what the difference is. Yeah, well, maybe, you, so usually when we're streaming and these cards fill up, I just put the cards aside, but maybe I'll actually dump the card to the NAS and we can watch how fast it copies just for fun. I think that would be interesting. All right, well, in the meantime, I've got these terminals open and I think we're recording everywhere we need to be and I can just push this button. Oh, I don't have the lithium battery simulator turned on. So I guess we'll get to see what it does when it doesn't have a lithium battery. That was not intentional. Usually I've been pretty careful to have the simulated lithium battery connected during all these tests, but I just spaced out turning on that power supply. So that bottom console is the VxWorks system booting up first. That also shows the bootloader. Then that console in the back is Linux, which might be more familiar. Ah, interesting. Demons wants to know, uh, well, they're, they're working on selecting a good microcontroller for an RF project, and they need a DSP and a processor. I've got the DSP picked up, but not the processor. So is, it's like a multi-chip solution, or are you doing, doing this on like a system on chip or an FPGA, or? <laughs> no disks, disks failed to load. Yes, I get that. That's cool. Um, I'm curious if we see any logging about the battery, which is now not being simulated. I'm also curious now if there are any OpenWRT ports for this system on chip. Because if that's available, maybe we could actually just get this thing running Linux. This wouldn't, like, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like the the proprietary, proprietary RAID on this thing is a bit of a deal breaker for a lot of folks, and it would be nice to have maybe just a plain vanilla Linux that you can load on here, and that would be pretty cool. ECC disabled, huh? That's another upgrade. The new server has 72 gigabytes of ECC RAM as opposed to two gigabytes of non-ECC RAM. Big upgrade, which seems to help a lot more than I expected. Just having enough room to keep all the file system metadata in RAM probably helps. And I've also been um, seeing some improvement. It's kind of hard to tell how much because I'm not really sure how to measure um, like relative IO latency improvements on ZFS, but at least just looking at like cache hits and like number of IOs, just like the number of IOs per second going to the SSDs would seem to indicate that they're helping the, S helping the spinning disks avoiding a lot of seeks. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, I'm just scrolling through this for completeness. I think we're actually gonna find the power info on the other, the other output. I think this board also has more, like I, maybe maybe you need external FIs, but I think it at least has more Ethernet Max that we're not using. So we could take a close look at the board and maybe there's a way to do a mod to add some extra ports, I don't know. <sighs> okay, um, what about this? Yeah, this is, this is talking about iSCSI a lot. I think a lot of that is because the interface that the Linux side of the system uses to talk to the VxWorks side, I think that's actually based on iSCSI over shared memory. But I think they actually have iSCSI support in other capacities also. So I wonder if there's a way to just configure it as an iSCSI device.
I expect it to be near the PMU initialization, which we're, I thought we just passed that. Oh, here we go. Mm, I thought we saw some voltage monitoring. I wonder why we're not getting errors about that. This seems capable of monitoring the voltage on the backup battery. Looks like a hardware bug. The power supply is off. I wonder if I measure that voltage at the terminals. Like maybe it's just measuring that because it's trying to charge the non existent battery and that's why it thinks the battery is not actually flat. I mean, that's still low enough that it should not expect to run on the battery. Like that's. That's a dead lithium battery voltage right there, but I, I don't know what they're doing with that number. I, I would be curious to know more about this, but I would be surprised if they want to speak with me on the record about it. Oh, I need to ditch these headphones. The wire is too short. It gave crash logs. Yeah, it's, it's been given crash logs. The crash logs are not extremely useful though. They just have user mode exceptions in them. And a lot of the stuff I've been trying to debug has been lower level than that. Just, you're just noticing your own charge circuit. That's not a battery. <sighs> this seems like it's part of the root cause. Like, this seems like maybe a complicated bug, but it seems like this plus what, you know, what we were seeing earlier and what we heard directly from them, it seems like maybe they had an error in their ability to notice that the battery was flat because of this. And that maybe that is why they failed to notice that it's not actually safe to run on battery power during a flash memory update. So, yeah, not really. A default mode if no battery. No, I don't think that's what we're, work we're working with. There are ways to reset this to default, but that's, that's not happening right now and it's not related to the battery voltage. All right, well, let's turn on the power supply maybe just for completeness. It doesn't seem to matter because it doesn't seem to be able to detect that it's not on. That, that's really funny actually. Like here I am thinking that maybe the reason it doesn't boot is that it doesn't have power when really the reason that it failed to boot is because it overwrote part of the flash memory because it failed to detect that it didn't have power. <laughs> All right, so I'm powering up the simulated lithium battery now, and it's just hanging out at 3.7 volts, not drawing any current, not trying to charge. And now it's trying to charge. Cool, it's expected. All right, so this is hanging out at a VXWorks prompt. 
Um, I think lab mode is off now, so it's just acting pretty normal. Um, I might reboot it just for completeness here because we just did like, uh, actually, should we boot it with the disks in or with the disks out? I think it might be more likely to reproduce that problem from earlier if I try to boot it with all the disks in. is saying something about it being a power fault on update. It was not a power fault. The issue was, I think, that it intentionally switched to the backup battery. Um, the AC power did not fault during this process. It was connected to a UPS in Iraq while all of this went down. You know, just out of abundance of superstition, I'm going to put one of these slightly more power hungry disks in that first slot. I don't know if it matters what order these appear in. All of these discs do have an existing Drobo disc pack on them, but I don't care about the contents. Oh gosh, the backplane isn't actually plugged in mechanically. All of this is still very tenuous. Leave the discs in, sure. <sighs> Ooh. Oh, you know what? I think the 10 gigabit, um, even, if, even if Adobe Premiere is not going to do enough parallel video encodes to actually matter, um, that might let me start doing time-lapse transcodes on my editing machine, which is much faster than the machine I currently use to do time-lapse transcodes. And that process is definitely CPU limited. Because I do, I do a lot of auto automatic time-lapsing as part of my workflow. Pretty much all these really long videos I get. I'll get these videos that are like, 200 gigabytes or whatever, and I'll need to uh, figure out how to get the gist of it pretty quickly. And so having a bunch of time lapses in the video library is pretty helpful. How's the printer doing? Which one is the printer? Oh yeah, I should swap the printer over to a new model. <sighs> this one, I don't know what this form factor is. It looks like a normal three and a half inch disc, but it's thinner. I don't know if it's half height, but it, maybe three quarter height. Either way, it's not extremely backplane friendly here. I can't tell if that's even slightly in. That's in. Guess we'll find out. There are a lot of things that are not really mechanically attached the way they should be, like the fan and the back plane and all of the discs and the motherboard.
those are in. Let's hit the power. Alright. Boot, boot, boot. Should we take off these debug wires? It seems like there's room to leave the MSP430 debug header in. Like I can do a more permanent job of attaching that maybe. And then the hot glued 30 gauge fly wires I added, it seems like all those can go. Looping. I wasn't really paying attention, but I think it's boot looping. I think we reproduced the problem. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um. That looks like a reliable boot loop. So last time I tried debugging this, it was with a different set of disks, but the symptoms were the same. And as far as I tracked it down, it was some kind of low level ARM exception happening in VxWorks kernel space. Um, and last time it seemed like I could avoid this in a few different ways, one of which was to have the first disk removed. So I'm gonna try that. I think the fan spun down a little bit now that it's not doing backups. I think the backup's finished. Okay, yeah, I think we just got past that same point. So it powers on the disks. I, I sometimes miss the context for the comments. Uh, G bonus saying, go for it. What was that in response to? I still don't know what to do with this device. Like, I think the options at this point are to, um, to just set it aside for additional projects here, um, or to try to, you know, get on the train, go down to Drobo headquarters, assuming that offer is still open, and to try to replace this with a different model. Um, or maybe one of you would be interested in this. I could do some kind of giveaway. I don't know. it use the first disk as an identifier? No, I don't think that's the kind of problem we're dealing with. I think this is either bad RAM and this is just like an ad hoc way of sidestepping that, which seems unlikely. It seems more likely this is an electrical problem with one of the disk power switches, but uh, there's a lot of other things it could be maybe. Anyway, it looks like it's running with a degraded disk array now which is cool. Um, 
I wonder if we'll get the same reboot when we actually hot plug the first disk. Yes. Okay. Well, I think the thing to do is to put some oscope probes on the voltage rails over there and just look to see if it's just a basic power problem even. Let's try to turn this thing off cleanly. I don't think the power management micro will let me shut it off right now, but maybe I'm wrong. It left the fan on. It's interesting, so I pressed the power switch while it was booting the VXWorks kernel, which seems like it might have canceled the boot but not actually powered it off. Can, oh, that's interesting. The activity light on the USB drive is flashing, which is interesting. Yeah, there are a lot of variables. It's part of why debugging entire computers is complicated, right? There's just a lot of hardware in them. Mm, I'm going to have to power cycle this thing the hard way, actually. Curious to see if I would notice it running off battery at all. Not so much, but I don't think it actually had that enabled. I don't think it would do that unless it actually had data in RAM it was trying to protect. Okay, just for consistency in my test setup, I'm going to make sure that we can reproduce the problem after that unclean shutdown and physically putting the disk back in. And assuming we can, um, I'll get the scope set up and we'll get some probes on there. stick the MSP430 somehow. Is that a problem? I think that was the problem. I think the MSP430 debugger broke. I mean, there was a debug break somehow. Did that unclean shutdown just break the bootloader? I don't see the disk flashing, but do we have terminal? Maybe this terminal is just frozen. It's possible we just crashed the Raspberry Pi. Maybe we crashed the Raspberry Pi. That would explain it. <sighs> Let's boot the Raspberry. sure what we'll have access to, but I figure there's probably a 12 volt and a 5 volt rail.
<laughs> got one uh, vote for taking them up on the replacement offer and then selling the new one, which, yeah, that might be a good idea. Maybe that's a more interesting project than uh, this actual object. I don't know, I'm still curious to hear what people think. If you've got an idea about what you would like to see me do with it, let me know. The usual, I mean, you know, the usual ways of getting in touch. Twitter or YouTube or Twitch or Diode Zone, like all of those systems, if you send me a message, I'll probably see it. chalk that up to some kind of electrical disturbance causing the reset on the raspberry. Oh, interesting. It's in the bootloader. Was the Raspberry Pi like kernel dumping or something? It shouldn't do that over this port though. This is a USB serial port. Nothing should be using it, but this is acting like we interrupted the boot with some serial port garbage, which is interesting. Yeah, the other thing that's annoying about replacing it, like taking them up on their offer, is that it is some time on transit. Like, it's not especially close by. It'd be like a four hour round trip. But, you know, if I can get a box that I can sell or, you know, give to someone that would, could use it, then that's probably worth it. was the reboot loop. Okay. Let's turn this off and get some probes attached. <sighs> I need to physically move this thing around a little more. I was being so delicate with it when it had all these disks that actually had data that I care about, but maybe I, did, I can be slightly less ginger with the whole setup right now. Hmm. Yeah, the Drobo folks, or at least at least some of them, are aware of the streams. Um, I think that's part of how they eventually got in touch with me. I'm not sure if it was that or going through the regular support channels. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they would be open to me like recording video there. My guess is no. I I feel like they've been, um, you know careful to not disclose details that they wouldn't want me to talk about on video at this point, which is probably a good idea, but I doubt, like, I don't know how much actual, like, access there is at this point. We could find out. That just involves a bunch of social spoons. I think I want to just rotate this whole thing a bit, get it closer to the soldering iron. Oh yeah, I don't currently have it connected to network at all. Which is probably good, because on my main network it would conflict with the IP address of my new server. Oh. Oh, I've got this nice long extension cable that's only slightly chewed up by Tuco. Like, I don't know, it would be really cool though if I 
if I could talk to the Drobo engineers and like actually talk through like, oh, well, this is like, this is like actually a hard problem is doing reliable firmware updates. And like, this is one of like many, many ways that you can go wrong. And like, you know, here's how they fixed it. And like, that would be really awesome. I just, I don't expect that level of transparency from most companies. Um, they tend to really like NDAs, but if that was possible, that would be pretty cool. It's just like, it's, it's like they don't even acknowledge that these problems are actually problems or are actually fixed in the, in the like change log for firmware updates. It's like, I feel like that would be the first step if we were actually going to be like uh, open about this, you know? Okay, I can see the back of the motherboard now. It is still powered up, it's just off. I mean, it's asleep. The motherboard has 12 volts. It's just not using much of it. And I've got the disc cage, like the plastic parts, kind of resting on this bit of plastic that's full of heat shrink tubing. And then the actual back plane is mostly just physically pressed onto the back of the discs, and that's it. Um, I'm going to guess that these three big old bulk electrolytic capacitors, four actually, next to the drive, might be a good place to probe. Um, could try soldering on a more persistent probing setup, or if I get a good ground somewhere at least, I could just hold, you know, a couple of probes on those capacitors as it reboot loops each time, which sounds annoying, but fine. But yeah, maybe, uh, Maybe I just unpower this completely and then solder some probe wires or look for nearby test points. Let's do that. So I'm gonna unplug the AC adapter. Oh, you know what? Maybe I can go back to powering this thing entirely off the bench supply. I was using the AC adapter mostly to avoid any possibility of um, current limiting on my actual disk array that I cared about because I did not want my disk array that I actually had useful data on to uh, to experience a current limiting condition where the power supply is just like, oh, that's too much. Let's let's give you less than 12 volts. That would not be good. Whereas the original power adapter is rated for more power than my, uh, I think it's rated for 10 amps. My supply over here is normally limited to three amps. You could put a couple of channels together and get six amps, but that still might not be uh, enough for some disk arrays. I don't know how much it's actually gonna be using now. Um, yeah, maybe that's a thing to try, actually, is just without, um, before I start actually attaching anything to this board, just try to reproduce the problem on bench supply, just to see if, you know, if there are any weird current surges, to see what, like, what magnitude of current we're dealing with, because, like, I haven't even been measuring it so far. So, now that the stakes are vastly lower, because I don't actually have any data I care about on this machine, we could do some more measuring. So I had that kind of set up already because I was doing it earlier. So I think I just need to move a couple of these clips. So I can unplug the Drobo from, I had it plugged into this tiny UPS just as some additional assurance. got the grounds commons together over here. There's this weird noise. I can't quite identify. I think sometimes this building has these weird mechanical oscillations and then sometimes I just feel like really hyper attentive to stuff that's going on in my environment. And so I'll notice stuff like that when I really don't need to. I'm also gonna turn on the O-scope, which is gonna make a little bit more noise.
Okay. That seems attached. Not quite as good as before. Do we need the PSU can? Where did that one go? Try this. Twelve volts, two and a half amps. Okay. So we get a little pulse of fan activity and then it turns off. Okay, I'm running the MSP debugger. Okay. Let's keep that somewhere. I know you won't be able to see that. It'll be on the recording later if something interesting happens. Oh, maybe I can put this right there. All right, and now I'm gonna hit the button. I'll just, this is another test run. Let's just see what happens. It just came really close to the current limit there. Oh, I think it's hitting the current limit. Yeah, this is not, not happy. Let's not do that. All right. Um, Well, I could use the other channel. Um, I've got another power supply that has a five amp rating. Um, or I could just take that second channel off the lithium battery duty and have it double up on the 12 volt. It doesn't seem like we need the lithium battery at this point. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to unplug the lithium battery simulator. And I'm going to link these two channels. Turn on and off at the same time now? No. I guess the voltages track, but the on off states don't. But I could use all on off. Let's try that. Not putting 12 volts into the battery. Let's not do that. Let's only put 12 volts in to the main input.
Okay. actually going to work. Well, we might have to use the original power brick, which is fine. Place to attach scope probes over here. I think I can unplug my battery simulator entirely just to get it out of the way. This is not a fancy battery simulator. This is just a power supply and a variable resistor to set the temperature sensor to emulate the temperature sensor. Read-write temperature sensors would certainly be one way to handle heating and cooling. running shockwave. Oh, <laughs> I don't think anyone did make that joke yet. Yeah, I just got to upgrade that. It'll be just fine for internet distribution. Yeah, you see, some power supplies, you can put them in parallel. It doesn't always work super well, though. I think I was still hitting the current limiting because they weren't tracking properly, even though it seems like they're supposed to be able to. That bunch of capacitors right there is slightly suspect. Not necessarily the capacitor itself, but like that might be an interesting voltage to monitor because maybe the, it might be the capacitors, but it also might be the switch connected to them or any number of the other components nearby or maybe none of the above. Gosh, maybe I should take this off of the metal part again. Assembly time. Yeah, a lot of multi channel power supplies let you link the channels together like that. Um, even, even a lot of like non digital ones will have a switch on the back that enables that mode. Um, sometimes you can even pass a control voltage from one power supply to another to, to do that between PSUs.
So these take the weird flat screws. Yeah, I wonder if I was if I was the Drobo engineering team, what would I like to get back? Would I want it to be fully assembled, or would I just want like a bag of circuit boards? It's probably easier to transport bullets fully assembled. This backplane seems to use a PCI Express style connector. The signals on it are almost certainly not related to PCI Express in the slightest. Um, this machine does use PCI, but I think the disk controllers are on the motherboard and the backplane handle, handles SATA. a garbage bag in the mail. I mean, it'd be, it'd be easier to do the exchange if I could mail it to them, maybe, but um, I don't know. It might be interesting to meet in person. It's just, yeah, it's like also, um, it's got all the downsides of meeting in person. <laughs> That's interesting. There's some ink marks on here, there, there, and there. I don't remember adding those. Maybe that's part of the manufacturing. Those are all pressed in. These little springs are interesting. It kind of looks like... I don't know if this is a great design. Like, it seems to press the discs differently depending on what kind of disc it is. Let's try to get a better shot of this. On these discs, which I think are old Seagates, it kind of hits the metal on the side and then hits kind of inside the box of the connectors, connector housing over here. And then over here, it hits in between the connector housing box and the metal part. Over here, it's on the edge of the connector box. Over here, it doesn't even hit the metal part. It just kind of straddles around the edges of the metal part. And then I think it's actually making contact kind of down here next to this screw. That's pretty weird. I kind of wonder if they redesign this in the next version also. You know, that would be that would be maybe one reason to get the new version is to do a comparison, both hardware and software. I think these are actually two sets of two capacitors. So I think this is actually just two power rails, which would make sense. I would expect these to be 5 and 12 volts. Buried my multimeter over here. Huh. Ken doesn't like it when people abuse connectors. I mean... I see where you're coming from. On the other hand, have you ever tried not abusing connectors? It's like, it's like really hard to get a good connector that is not an existing standard, unless you're a giant company that can just make custom connectors all day. Yeah, that's a good question. Would they just send me the new one without 
wanting the old one. <laughs> and I could just do a side-by-side -side deconstruction. That would be pretty cool. I don't know if they want that, but I haven't actually asked them. I, I have a hard time just like talking to people on the phone if, if, if that doesn't come up, but it might be worthwhile. I, I do it sometimes, it's just I try not to. So yeah, I think these are just the same. And these two. was a bad close-up, but okay. So yeah, power switching. We've got these little aluminum electrolytics, which could be anything. You never really know with these. Some of them are really good, some of them are really bad. And these are probably MOSFETs or integrated load switches of some sort. Yeah, um, I guess there's a few ways to go about this. There's just a lot of places to probe, um, but not quite enough room to get the hook probe around any of these. So maybe I just solder on a couple of little wires. Got a tiny wire over here. We'll just use this. This is a little nerve wracking because these are probably not extremely current limited, but you know, it's probably fine. Feels wrong to do this without the microscope. How much working distance do I go here? Oh, that's no microscope, that's a telescope. Cool. That's, the microscope's way up there. I should be recording this. There is a slight problem with my OBS configuration files, which make that kind of a problem, but that's fine. I've got at least, I've got this recording of the stream. It's just usually I like to have a separate clean recording of the microscope. This is not going well. Mm -hmm. I think we need 
a different tip, a different angle, more flux, maybe all of the above. Fluidic optical connectors. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you want to go, you know, make a big old science back plane, that sounds like a good way to do it. Efficiently cleaning my desk before streaming. This project was supposed to be about cleaning my desk. I want to get this off my desk. I'm just going to tin a couple of little bits of wire that I can hook oscilloscope probes up to very temporarily. Oh yeah, where's my ground? Not a lot of just exposed ground plane on this board. We'll find something. It's just barely stuck on. Actually, it's not bad. Um, ground. I think that left side of... Oh, actually, that is... so. In their design, they designed the chassis ground and whatever that other ground on the left is to be different, potentially. But then they've had the option to connect them with a zero ohm resistor, which seems to be what's going on. So I think all of those grounds should be pretty equivalent, but let's find out. So that's connected to there. Which is the same as, it's the same as the ground on the on the fan over here. And these capacitors. Yeah, I mean, I think we can just clip on wherever. Maybe we can just use this unused capacitor pad over here. Another tiny piece of wire. I just have so much of this stuff that it would be convenient to leave out, but I can't because the cat. This would be faster if I wasn't filming and I wasn't keeping things cat-proofed. 
but it's part of the job now. Okay, that'll do. Hopefully they at least put the components on not the side that's directly pressed up against the hard disks. It seems like keeping this board pressed against the drives is a bit of a limitation. Okay. Kind of hard to do nicely. And this is a very thick circuit board, probably for that reason. <laughs> Is that a yawn emoji? Is that because it's boring or because it's late? I'd probably agree either way. So I don't know which is which, but I assume we've got 5 volts and 12 volts, and let's just put them both on the oscope. Delicate.
better. Okay, I think I'm about ready to run this test. The goal of this experiment is to try to see if the reset that I'm seeing might be related to power switching or um, inrush current issues on this side. So what I would be looking for is maybe any kind of like a dip in the power supplies after it's been switched on, which might indicate that either the switching is not working or that it's causing a dip on the main power supply. Um, it would also make sense to monitor whatever power supply is feeding into this here. I just don't know exactly where that is, and I'd rather just trace this rather than trying to debug like, where to monitor a third signal. So this is what I'm going to start with. I've got the back plane plugged in, four disk drives. I'm going to plug in the stock power adapter. Oh, and we're not using the simulated lithium battery. That is empty. Oh. That's interesting. It looks like we've already got 5 volts and 12 volts, and I wasn't expecting the system to be on. So maybe this is pre-power switch. That's interesting. Um, let's reconnect the MSP debugger. fan almost blew itself over just then. Okay, MSP debugger is running. And let's get the boot output. Tell if we're getting output. I wonder if the raspberry is frozen again. The raspberry is not frozen, but I think we might have lost USB. I can hear the disk spinning up now. And I'm just missing serial output because I think my Raspberry needs rebooting. Or at least I need to restart. Mm -hmm. Raspberry needs rebooting. Huh. Was that the reboot? So we have yellow lights on the front panel, like this is trying to boot. I'm just not actually seeing the serial output right now. Oh yeah, we lost one of the serial adapters. Even after rebooting the Raspberry. Um, oh. I lost the power adapter from my powered hub, which would explain why my serial adapters keep undervolting or whatever. Somewhere 
where it won't fall out. Start this with less less problems. Well, perhaps this stream of me kind of aimlessly wondering what to do with this drobo has provided enough material to at least wrap up a single episode about it. Because um, I think I've explained everything that's happened so far. Um, you know, got the data off, got some options for what to do with it, haven't actually committed to any of those options yet. TTO USB 1. Did we actually break a USB adapter again? I was having trouble with one of these being flaky before. This is an annoying problem to have now. I wasn't looking at the scope, but I haven't seen the fluctuations yet. Maybe someone else has been paying more attention to, to it than I have. Okay, so I'm powering off the USB hub. I'm attaching the AC adapter to the USB hub without the upstream USB port. And then I'm plugging in the upstream USB. one serial port here still. Uh. Try the same reset but unpowering the Drobo also in case the serial port was like in latch up because it was being back powered or something. Yeah, it is getting pretty late. I understand if a lot of folks are dropping off. I'll see you all next time. And maybe the next one won't be about the Drobo. I feel like I should really put this together and use my desk for other things. Um, so like there's, there's a lot more we could do with the Drobo, but um, yeah, if you're, if you're watching this in the archives, let me know if you have suggestions. Um, otherwise, I think my next order of business is mostly going to be to put this together enough that I can get it off my desk at least, and, and then we can decide what to do with it longer term. There we go. I think that was, I think maybe my hunch was right that it was maybe in some kind of latch up state from being back powered. Um, anyway, can we open two mini-coms? Oh, I've already got a mini-com. Which of these is right? <laughs> hmm. Oh yeah, before I totally wrap up the stream, I do want to try storing my camera footage just to see how well that works with the new setup. Okay, um, I think we've got too many comms. I think we are not powered, so we need power and then MSP430 reset. Just because I've got the debugger attached.
Hey there, fan. I see you. We do need the scope on screen, don't we? This will do. A little room for Linux and some more room for VXWorks. <sighs> okay, let's push the button carefully. Okay, so this should be rebooting in that loop again, assuming nothing changed, but we now have the oscope monitoring the power at that top disk drive where it seemed like maybe there was some issue. And I don't really have any evidence that it's a power problem at this point. It's just one of the hypotheses to test because it's something that fits the symptoms. That was the reset. I didn't see anything on the power, but let's try a different time scale. I could AC couple and look closer if we don't see anything at this scale. These these old discs definitely make the machine start up a little louder than it was without the discs, huh? Yeah, the human shutdown messages, that seems useful. I should broadcast that out to all my friends when I'm sleeping. <laughs> I don't know if this happens to anyone else, but do you ever like check your phone right before bed and then realize that someone was trying to get a hold of you and then end up in a, in a conversation like when you're actually trying to sleep? It's like, I need a way to say like, well, I just need to be good at like, okay, I, I, I got this. I'm responding to you in this immediate capacity, but also let's talk later. Sometimes that works. <laughs> I didn't see anything going on with the power, but yeah, so that's, that's the problem right there. And all I know about it so far is that it seems to involve the VXWorks ARM core going into um, one of its low-level exception handlers. We got as far as like patching that code in RAM in order to add like a debug breakpoint so that we could get the stack dump ourselves. It was very terrible. It was like patching in a hex dump into this interrupt handler. Um, so yeah, we, we were hitting this very low level problem and whatever debug facility you would usually use to debug this seems to be disabled. So before I got around it just by removing the first disk, I think the next step was going to be to try to do JTAG, which was going to be interesting because this is a multi-core processor and I've never done multi-core JTAG, so that might be fun. Um, but yeah. I'm gonna zoom in the scope a little bit and see if this looks more interesting. Or by zoom in, I actually mean I'm gonna use AC coupling and I'm going to change the time scale on, well, both the time scale and the voltage scale probably. Not the most ergonomic place for my oscope. I 
be a little bump on that red trace, right? But like this is down in the weeds of like power analysis. This isn't like I'm not seeing anything that would cause a reset at this point. Watch it carefully through one more cycle. Oh gosh, is the clock set to 2088 somehow? Well, maybe I'll notice something that I'm missing right now, going back and looking at the video footage, but I don't see anything. Um, we could do a more targeted approach to look for glitches, but I'm, I'm not feeling super confident that this is worth pursuing at this point. Um, I, I still think my, my number one theory about why this reset is happening is that it is related to corrupted software. Um, Like this might be related to something, um, I mean, either either just like a corrupted binary or a hardware incompatibility with the version of the SATA driver that we're using right now. Since it seems like it might be related to the SATA subsystem in VXWorks, like in the kernel, but I, that's really hard to say with the amount of debugging I've done on it so far. Anyway, I think that's basically it. Let's uh, let's store some footage. Maybe stop this reboot loop. Can I stop it? I think that turned it off. Yeah, and it does seem like those uh, switching supplies there. Okay, so the noise we're seeing now is just like in this setup, not caused by the power supply. It might be from the serial adapters or something else in the setup or just like EMI. But that level of noise wasn't even from the DC converters. Um, all right. Yeah, I can't think of anything else to do with this particular test setup right now other than put it away. I don't really need to get footage of the yeah, that's interesting. That's on the board, but it wasn't actually connected to anything except for the MSP430 debug adapter. This is probably just like EMI coming from the grounding in this whole setup. <sighs> Let's try storing footage. So usually I don't do this on camera, but let's try it out. Away my camera. Oh. All right, and then this card goes in the reader over on my desk. USB 3 card reader on a bunch of long wires and hubs, but I don't have any reason to believe that it's dropping frames, so regular USB 3 speeds, probably. I guess that's this drive. Turn off some of this junk I'm not using. All right. So 
So yeah, that's probably limited by the speed of the SD card reader, or the SD card itself at this point. About 30 megabytes a second. Also completely doesn't need 10 gig, but nice to have the comparison. I still am hopeful that I can get Adobe Premiere to process renders a bit faster if I can figure out how to parallelize some of the process. Um, so one thing that's legitimately annoying is that I can't work on like one project while another project is rendering. So I might need to like run multiple copies of Premiere on different user accounts or something like that. I don't know if there's a good way to just launch launch it twice even. Because usually when you open multiple projects in Premiere, it opens them all in the same user interface. And a modal dialog in one project blocks your entire workflow, which is super annoying. So um, for like doing final renders, there's this asynchronous um, like separate compression and rendering tool, which is great. I like that a lot. But it only works for final renders as far as I know. I don't know that you can do preview renders with that, which is often like often what I'll do is I'll do like a rough edit on some footage that has some time lapsed components. And then I'll need to do a final edit on that, but I'll need to like do a preview render of the time lapse to get that final edit. So maybe there's just a different workflow. Like maybe I should instead of using the preview renders at all, maybe I should just like replace the rough edit timeline with because uh, if I have more temporary space, I could just do more intermediate renders to like losslessly compressed formats and just do it that way. So yeah, there's some workflow workflow issues to work through, but it's nice not having the huge storage bottleneck that I was having before. This will still take a little while to write. It's actually at this point, it seems like I should have more more SD card readers, because <laughs> often I'll end a day of filming like this with a stack of SD cards, and I could slurp them all in concurrently then. Anyway, I think that's all for today. Um, thanks so much for everyone, everyone's support. Uh, it's great to be able to continue doing something that people find useful and inspiring. So if you've got input on how I can continue making things useful or inspiring to you, then I'm all ears. Um, but yeah, otherwise I'll just uh, be back soon with some more of this and try to figure out how to how to direct this workflow into producing the most content that all of you enjoy as possible. And as I was saying earlier, if you're just tuning in now for the outro, then um, the Drobo project, I'm not really sure where to go now. It seems like there's some options, including just putting it back together and swapping it out for the new unit if that option is still available, which it might be. Um, but if you have input on what you'd like to see me do, then uh, let me know, because it seems like there's a lot of options and I'm no longer waiting on this for my critical footage infrastructure. So it's more like an open-ended project at this point. Anyway, happy hacking, everyone. And a uh, special thanks to everyone who supports the channel by sending in hardware, by sending in uh, Patreon dollars every month. That's what lets me keep this going as my full-time gig. And so if you like that, then uh, let me know what you like about it and I'll try to try to keep things focused. Um, anyway, as always, happy hacking, folks. Looks like my copy failed, or copy uh, succeeded too. Anyway, see you next time.